Japanese audiophiles are known for going to extreme lengths. Itsushi Hamasaki lives in a 250 square foot apartment so he can afford to spend more money on his stereo system. His speakers alone cost $100,000. Hamasaki's apartment is so small that he has to move his couch to open his refrigerator. Another sacrifice, he says he hasn't purchased new clothes in about 15 years. A small price to pay for what could be the most essential part of his life. Ah, yes, here it is. Yes. How much you want for it? Ah. There's, oh, no. You know what? I don't think I'm selling it this week. Maybe next oh, week. Oh, no. You said that last week. Did I? Yeah, well, I just... I... I, I played... You know, I don't have that record. I'll buy it for 40. We're up. So... Now, why would you sell it to me and not to him? Because you're not a geek, Lewis. You guys are snob. No, we're not. No, seriously, you're totally elitist. You feel like the unappreciated scholars, so you shit on the people who know less than you. No, which is everybody. Yeah. yeah. It's just sad. That's all. Hey there, vinyl community. So I've been talking about in my previous videos wanting and you know having the desire to do more general instructional videos on topics of vinyl and audio equipment, things like that. You know, um, a little bit different for the more like niche uh, and nerdy record collector videos that I normally do, record updates and equipment videos and things like that. I wanted to do, you know, make a video that's geared more towards education and people getting into this hobby. And, um, you know, I, I just haven't seen enough of those and I haven't seen them done very well in the YouTube vinyl community. So I, I kind of wanted to be the one to, to help pass on knowledge to people that are looking to get into record collecting, into the whole vinyl hobby. And, um, this is also inspired by the fact that I have so many friends that come up to me and, you know, want to get into vinyl, want to get into audio, and it's always kind of, um, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of information um, to, really, to really dive into this hobby safely, I think, and I always feel a little overwhelmed trying to explain it to everyone that, that messages me or that, you know, comes, wants to talk to me. And so I thought, what better avenue than to just make a video on this topic and have it be like, a resource to you know both friends and you know people out there in the YouTube community looking to discover the joy of of record collecting, especially from an audio standpoint, because I think that's really where I'm coming from in this hobby. So um, yeah, I, I just uh, I guess I'll start with you know why record collecting is enjoyable for me and and, and like why I collect records and why I think people should collect records. Um, you know, I think the most important thing for me personally is is audio quality. You know, there's a lot of online debates about audio quality, which format is better, and I'm just going to come right out and say it. I think, you know, when you take all the advantages and disadvantages and, and weigh everything together, I think if you're looking for, um, you know, if, if all other things are equal, I think vinyl is the superior format for audio quality. Um, you know, all the best sounding recordings I've heard have for the most part been on vinyl. And this requires a bit of explanation because it doesn't just mean that if you have a record in a CD, the record's automatically gonna sound better. There's a lot of factors that go into the way a vinyl record is produced that may determine, you know, what's going to be the better sounding, um, you know, pressing format, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is that, you know, if something is recorded well, particularly on analog tape and it's mixed and mastered with care, I think vinyl has the most potential to let the recording shine and, and you know, have a natural timbre to the sound and, and really sound realistic, sound like the most convincing thing. Um, you know, there are, you know, the argument could be made that reel-to-reel -reel is that format, is, is actually the best sounding format, but reel-to-reel -reel has a lot of impra impracticalities to it. It's, it's very expensive. Um, every time you dub a reel-to-reel, -reel, you're going you know, certain generations away from the master tape, you're wearing out the master tape. So vinyl is a little more practical than reel-to-reel, -reel, I think. And um, yet it, it doesn't sacrifice all that much in audio quality. Um, you know, I've heard lots of good high-res digital recordings over the years, and I do listen to high-res digital. I listen to SACD, I listen to Blu-ray audio, I listen to high-res digital files, and I think that the best of those formats are very good. Um, it's not like I'm only exclusively listening to vinyl, but I think if you have a good a good stereo system, 
I think vinyl, vinyl can be the most rewarding listening experience. And, um, you know, it could be that it's an all analog pressing or it could be that it's a, it's a high res digital pressing that's a record cut from high res digital files. But, um, you know, all things being equal, I think a record cut from high res digital files can sometimes sound better than the digital files themselves if it's mastered in the right way. You have to have the right people working on the record. Um, so that's the main reason I find vinyl a rewarding listen. I think if you have a good stereo system, vinyl just brings something to the table that other formats don't do as well. Um, you know, people are free to disagree about that, but I, I think that's the main strength of, of vinyl records. Um, another strength of vinyl records is it's just a different listening uh, experience in terms of like what you're actually doing when you're listening. You know, a vinyl record involves, you know, sitting down, putting something on the table, and, and just naturally you end up devoting more attention to it because of the process of it, you know, getting up to change sides, things like that. It, it definitely is a different experience from the way people listen to music, especially I, I think in the 2010s, like nowadays, when um, you know music is streamed and it's always kind of this background thing. Very few people today will devote actual time to sitting down and listening to something. It's, you know, music tends to accompany multitasking. And um, I think part of the, the allure of vinyl, vinyl records is that, um, you know, the way our previous generations experienced this music was really like the music was the event. You know, sitting down to listen to records was a thing people did to hang out. And it was, it was an experience. And I think, you know, um, I'm not saying you have to listen to music that way, but I'm, say, I'm saying there definitely is an advantage to listening to music that way. It's something we don't always get in our listening experiences nowadays. And so as, as, a, as a professional musician, I do really, you know, um, I enjoy the kind of focus and concentration of, of like music experience in a concert hall. And I think vinyl is the next best thing to that experience. I think vinyl allows us to, um, you know, sit and focus and give attention to the artwork. And I think that also, you know, it changes our listening habits and it also changes the kind of things we listen for in music. You know, the kind of music you're going to listen to while you're doing your dishes, I think, is, is different from the music you sit down and pay attention to. Um, you know, music that's too complicated and busy or, you know, has all this nuance to it is not going to be the kind of music you want to, like, work out to. But it may be the music you want to just sit down and, like, space out to. Um, I didn't intend for that to rhyme. <laughs> um, so I think not only does it encourage better listening habits, but it, I think it encourages like a healthier attitude and uh, towards like music appreciation. That's another strength of vinyl. And then you know finally, the whole ritual of record collecting I think is is an experience. There is such a thing as the thrill of the hunt, and when you get really passionate about you know collecting music and especially collecting different versions of music. Um, there's so much fun in that, like, there's so much fun in, in going to a record store and hunting down, you know, an original UK pressing of some British prog album or, you know, like, a German pressing of some orchestral work. These are, um, these are things that, that are, that really become, you know, incredibly nerdy but really enjoyable. Um, so I think, you know, all those different factors, you know, and people may like different parts of this, you know, people may be more about the ritual than they are about the sound quality. People may be more about, you know, the hobby of collecting than they are about the actual listening. But um, that's just like where, where it is for me. That's what I, these are the things that make it uh, record collecting and, and vinyl in general enjoyable for me. So, you know, that's just what I wanted to touch on. So the, the point of this video is to, is to, you know, for me to pass on my knowledge and my experience to people that may be looking to get into this hobby or are already getting into this hobby but would just like some more, um, you know, some more guidance and direction. So I'm going to do my best to talk about my experience and what I look for and, and my advice on mistakes to avoid. So right away, if you're if you're if you're watching this and you know you don't have a turntable yet, and, and you or maybe you haven't started your record collection, or you're, you're just kind of curious, I guess my first piece of advice is do not buy a plastic all-in-one turntable or any of these these you know cheap uh, department store all-in-one turntables. Um, 
it's a bad idea. I'm talking about Crosley turntables. I'm talking about Ion turntables. I'm talking about Stanton. Um, you know, anything that has speakers in the turntable, anything that looks like it's primarily made out of plastic, uh, anything that has a short little stubby tone arm, um, these are bad ideas. And I'm going to talk about why they're bad ideas. Um, because I think a in order to really appreciate everything this format has to offer, you have to have a certain level of, of gear. And that's not me being snobby. I, I'm going to explain the science behind this. Um, so, you know, because playing back a vinyl record is different than playing back a CD. It's, it's not a laser reading ones and zeros. This is a physical format that's uh, a needle is reading the grooves of a record and vibrating. And the vibration of that needle is, is the sound that gets fed through your amplifier to speakers. Um, and so physical aspects are a lot more important than in digital formats. So one really important physical aspect is vibration. A cheap turntable will have little to no vibration control. It will be made out of complete plastic. And of course, if you have speakers in the turntable, I mean, the whole thing is going to be vibrating. And when the source of your sound is vibration, you want as little excess vibration um, as possible. So if you have a feedback loop of vibration, like in these cheap turntables, it's just going to be bad. That's one big reason. Another big reason is um, most of these turntables, these we're talking like less than $100 here, most of these turntables have no counterweight. There's no way to balance the tone arm. So they make the tone arms just, the tone arms weigh what they weigh and they just sit on the record and there's no way to adjust and it's whatever it is and usually it's on the heavy side. Um, so this imprecise measurement of the needle pushing down on the record, the stylus pushing down on the record, um, is, is not good for record wear. Um, you know, a, a record that is cared for properly can last more than a lifetime. I, you know, I have records from well before I was born. I have records from the 50s and 60s that sound immaculate because they were cared for correctly and they were played back on decent quality turntables. But if you're playing things back on a unweighted tone arm um, that's tracking at like four grams, that's made out of a, like the cartridge is ceramic, the stylus is ceramic, not a, not a good diamond stylus, um, it's going to cost groove wear. Um, so the, the weight of the tone arm is a big thing, and if, if you can't calibrate that on a turntable, that's a big red flag right there. Um, uh, the materials of the stylus, you know, cheap turntables, these Crosley turntables that come with ceramic cartridges that just chew into grooves, because then you have, like, when you have ceramic or plastic cartridges, I mean plastic on plastic, they're both going to wear down. Um, this is why good quality styluses are, you know, made out of, you know, diamond or other hard materials um, because they, they, um, they're not going to wear against the plastic as much. Uh, and I, another big thing that I think often gets overlooked is um, tone arm arc or trajectory. I really should have drawn a, uh, a diagram to illustrate this. I'm going to see if I can find a diagram and put it up there. I don't know. We'll see what I figure out in the post-processing. But, um, so when you have these, you know, these cheap toy turntables, I'm going to just call them toy turntables from now on because that's what they are. They're novelties. Um, you have these, these little stubby tone arms. And the way uh, vinyl record uh, geometry works is that the tone arm moves across the grooves, across the surface of the record, and um, the arc of the tone arm um, is never going to be perfectly parallel to the groove of the record. Because, it, just think about it, if you have something like this and the tone arm is moving across it in an arc, um, there's going to be a moment of perfect parallel symmetry, um, or perpendicular, perpendicular parallel symmetry with the groove uh, when that tone arm's in place and everywhere else is going to be just a little bit off. Now really high-end turntables, these, these have um, you know, tone arms that are, are generally longer because the longer the tone arm is, the less tracking error you're going to have along the grooves. So that's why you see really expensive turntables, really high-end turntables may have like 12-inch tone arms because the longer the tone arm is, um, the better the geometry against the groove is and the less tracking error you're going to have. When you have a short little stubby tone arm, what happens is that the, the error is greater. 
um, in terms of in terms of you know where the tone arm gets offset from the grooves. So when it's traveling along the record, eventually it will be like this, and you're going to have more more uh, tracking error. The reason that's important is eventually, you know, uh, when the when the stylus is along the grooves, if it's perpendicular, if it's moving too far one direction in the grooves, you're going to have wear against the walls of the groove. Um, so these short tone arms are not going to track well in the grooves and they're going to cause more groove damage which is going to create distortion in your records and it's also not going to sound good. Uh, the, the more tracking error is the worse the worse the playback will sound. So that's, that's the one aspect I think that actually gets overlooked in talking about these tables. Everyone talks about the tracking weight, everyone talks about um, you know, the, them being made out of poor materials and, and not being able to control vibration or dampen vibration. Um, but no one really talks about tone arm arc and trajectory, and I, that's a really big one, and, and, it, and it shouldn't be overlooked. So, you know, that's the technical reasons why these turntables are bad, and I, and I plead with you to ignore them. And I know some people say, well, I can't afford a $300, $400 turntable. And my answer to that is, well, first of all, vinyl, vinyl record collecting is not a cheap hobby. If you're looking to listen to music in the cheapest way possible, I'm sorry, this isn't, this isn't a good hobby. Um, you know, vinyl records are expensive, art is expensive, and if you're going to invest in vinyl records, you know, which on average cost around, you know, between $20 to $40, you should have a decent playback system that isn't going to ruin them, and that is going to sound okay because, like I said, one of the one of the big important aspects and one of the reasons why I personally love vinyl records is is the sound quality, and you want something that can at least do you know partial justice to that sound quality. Um, you know, you can play a record on almost anything, and there's going to be a sound that comes out, but um, you want that sound to be good, and you don't want the device to cause damage to your records, and that's what these toy turntables do. They cause damage and they sound bad. So I, I, I can't say strongly enough, avoid these things at all costs. Do not buy a Crosley. Do not buy, you know, even Audio-Technica, especially the entry-level Audio-Technicas, have these problems. Um, Ion, Stanton, uh, you know, just, you know what the kind of, you know the kind of table I'm talking about. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you recommendations on equipment I'm going to do it a little later in the video. First, I want to talk about you know some more basics before I get into specific gear recommendations. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, how to handle records because you know we're from a generation where this stuff just isn't common knowledge anymore. It used to be common knowledge. The stuff used to be you know pop culture. Vinyl records used to be the medium for listening to music, and they're not anymore. And because of that, the education really isn't there. Vinyl's coming back, people are buying records, but they don't really know a lot about them. Um, and so, you know, vinyl records you have to handle in a different way than you handle other media. Because when you play a vinyl record, you're playing the physical groove of, of the record. You're not reading ones and zeros off it. Um, so they are sensitive to things like the oils from your hands. You never want to put your hands on a record. I'm going to show you how to take a record out of the sleeve and, and handle it. So we have a record here. It's the, the Melvins live at Amoeba Records. So it should have an inner sleeve. Now a good inner sleeve is an inner sleeve that is either like this, which is plastic lined, or just completely made of plastic. If your record comes with a, a purely paper inner sleeve, it's only made out of paper, I would recommend replacing that inner sleeve with uh, either one that's completely plastic, like uh, Mobile Fidelity inner record sleeves, or one like this that is uh, paper on the outside and plastic lined on the inside. The reason for that is paper is coarse, and um, when you move a record in and out of a paper sleeve, it's actually going to, um, there's actually a lot of friction there, and it can, it can cause some damage of the record. Um, so you want, you want to protect you and preserve your records, so I think plastic lined inner sleeves are the way to go. Um, so I'm going to show you how to safely take a record out of its sleeve now, if you're going to play the record or handle it in any way. So you'll notice I'm sticking my hand into the sleeve, I'm not touching the record, I'm sticking my hand into the sleeve and placing my hand, uh, the tips of my fingers on the center label 
and the outside of my thumb on the side of the record. And I'm removing it from the sleeve like this. Does everyone see how I'm holding this? So I'm not actually putting my fingers or my hand on the playing surface of the record. I'm holding it like this. And when I go to put it on the turntable, I'm going to hold it on the sides like this. Um, one thing that, that some people do that I highly recommend against is do not pull out a record like this using the tips of your fingers. Even though you're, you think you're just holding the lead-in groove of the record and not the actual music, what happens is um, in, uh, what happens is that when you pull on, on the edges of the record with your fingers, you're touching the lead-in groove. And what happens is you put the needle, when you go to play the record, you put the needle down on the lead-in groove. And even though you didn't touch the grooves of the music, you touch the lead-in groove. So your oil is on that lead-in groove. The stylus, the needle of the, of the turntable will pick up your oil, your hand oil. And it doesn't matter how many times you wash your hands, your hand is going to have that oil on it. Uh, it's just a natural part of being human. Um, and the stylus will pick up the oil from the leading groove of the record and carry it through the rest of the record. It will drag it through. Um, it's like when you, when you step in mud and then you walk in the house. Even though you're not in mud anymore, you're tracking mud through the house. That's this, it's the same way with the oils of your hand. And what happens is that oil, which is slimy when you apply it, when you when it's on your fingers, um, will eventually dry and harden in the record and it will create distortion. Um, so if you really want to take good care of your records, that's how you handle the record. That's how you handle a vinyl record. And if you do that and treat your records well, they will outlive you and you can pass them on to your children and they'll still sound great. So now that we have that out of the way, I want to talk about one more thing in terms of record care. And um, this is a topic that lots of different people have lots of different opinions on. And um, this is just what my experience has taught me and what my, my uh, research has taught me. And this is about record cleaning. So um, one thing I'm going to say right off the bat is, is if you want to buy used records, second-hand records, which is great. It's half the fun of collecting records. You know, who just wants to buy new records? Who want to buy, you know, original pressings, things like that. If you plan on buying used records, you must have some way to clean your records. You cannot play old, dusty, dirty records on your turntable. It will damage the record because there's dust in the grooves and the, the needle will just plow that debris in more further into the record. It will embed it in the plastic. Um, so you'll damage your records and you'll damage your stylus. And if you've invested some money in a good turntable table with a good stylus, and if you play crappy, um, dirty records on that stylus, you're going to be looking at, you know, 50, 100, 200 dollars to replace that stylus. And that's just, that's just ridiculous. Um, so you need to clean your records. And honestly, um, you know, I, not only do I clean my, my, used records, I clean my new records. Every single record before it goes in the collection gets run on my record cleaning machine. And so that's what I'm going to talk about now is, is the way to clean records. Um, the reason, uh, before that, the reason, so the reason I clean not only my old records but also my new records is the fact that vinyl records are not produced in what's called a clean facility. It means the places where they're making vinyl records are, are basically factory floors and there's dust there. There's um, debris there. Uh, I've opened new vinyl records and, and there, is, there is, you know, dust in the grooves because they're not produced in, you know, um, super clean facilities. And that's not the fault of record producers, it's just the reality of, of you know, industrial plants. Um, so there's going to be, be debris there. There's also... Um, uh, in the vinyl record making process, they, they also um, use a compound that's a mold release compound to, to prohibit and, and get rid of any possible mold from forming in the process. So, um, you know, that's a chemical that's on the records that you also probably, it doesn't hurt to get rid of. So as a rule, I just, I clean every record that comes in my door, whether it be new or used. I clean it once on the vacuum record cleaning machine and normally, no matter, you know, because I take good care of my records, um, and, and, and I'm careful when I'm playing them, I usually don't have to clean them after that. So I clean everything when it comes in the door, and then if I'm good. 
um, I, I can count on one hand the number of records I've had to clean a second time since I bought them. So, you know, it's not like this thing where you have to vacuum, you know, vacuum clean your records all the time. Um, the only thing I do before I play every record is, is I will use the carbon fiber brush on the spinning record when I put it on the turntable, but that's, that's, I don't consider that cleaning, I just that consider that a step before I play the record. So now I'm going to talk about, you know, how to clean a record, and, and obviously, like I, like I hinted at before, I think the most efficient way to do that is through vacuum cleaning. Um, you know, dry cleaning a record with an anti-static cloth or a brush, you know, you may be able to wipe off some visible stuff, but you're really not getting into the grooves with that stuff. Um, it's, it's a very inefficient in way to clean a record, and it doesn't really do the job. Um, and then there's, there's devices like the Spin Clean record cleaning kit, where you, you, you get the record, record wet, and then you scrub it, but then you just let it air dry. And, and to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense, because, yeah, you got the record wet, and you scrubbed it, but whatever's on the record is still on the record, and you just kind of wet it and moved it around, and maybe some of it washed off, but you're not really, to me, that's not really a deep clean. And um, there's a lot of people in a lot of forums um, that seem to think putting wood glue on your records, letting it dry, and ripping off the dried wood glue is a good way to clean records. However, um, I do not recommend that method. Uh, I have read plenty of horror stories of people ruining very valuable and expensive records this way because there's a lot of chemicals in wood glue and it may not dry right or you may not be able to get it off the record or, you know, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, some people swear by it, but to me, I think it's a bad idea. You, you don't want to risk your music collection to, you know, this kind of DIY method involving potentially unknown chemicals. Uh, you know, adhering to plastic. This is, it's just, you know, um, you could, you could also, you know, the, the plastic hardening and ex the, the chemicals, the, the wood glue hardening and expanding, because it does expand when it hardens, could damage the inner grooves of the records. It's, it's a ton of unknown variables that I don't feel comfortable dealing with, and my advice to my audience is to not clean your records that way. I think it's a bad idea. Um, obviously, I'm not your mother. I can't tell you what to do. But I, I just think that's it's a not smart way to do it. So what do I think is a smart way? Well, I think there are two two really viable and and effective ways to clean your records. One is to use what's called a vacuum record cleaning machine, and this is a method that I use. And I think of the two methods that I think work, I think right now this is the cheaper method. And what you do is is you get a record cleaning solution, um, which are often you know some secret formula, like lots of companies sell these cleaning solutions, they're often some type of formula of like a little bit of soap and alcohol and distilled water. Um, some people m make their own record cleaning solutions. I always think that's also, again, a little risky, but um, not quite as dumb as, as using uh, chemical wood glue. <laughs> But anyway, so you use some kind of record cleaning solution, you get a, a, a record brush, and you, you spread the solution on the record. And then you, you put the record on a machine that will essentially vacuum suck that the mixture of solution and whatever debris were on your record, it will suck that off the record like a vacuum. It is a vacuum. Um, and so, you know, various record cleaning machines accomplish this in different ways. Um, some of the cheaper ones have you turn the record by hand over some felt lips that have the vacuum underneath and, and you slowly turn and it sucks the dirty liquid off the record and you have a clean, pristine, dry record. Um, the slightly more expensive yet far less labor intensive record cleaning machines um, have a have a spinning motor and you put the record down, you smear the liquid on it, spread it around, and then you turn it on and the record turns and it sucks off the liquid automatically and you don't have to crank it by hand. Um, so there's a number of machines that do this, uh, made by many different companies. Um, some of the main companies that, that make these machines are Record Doctor, Nitty Gritty, uh, Project, VPI, Okie Noki, 
um, you know, they all make record cleaning machines and they offer them at various different price points. I'm going to give you a recommendations um, for a couple machines that I'm familiar with that, that do good work. Um, you know, if you have a limited budget and you can't, you can't simply can't spend a lot of money on a record cleaning machine, I think the cheapest record cleaning machine you have available to you that's decent is uh, a machine called the Record Doctor 5. You know, this is a one that I think is, is made, it made specifically for um, the website Audio Advisor. I think they're the only ones that are the dealers of it. Um, I think it's actually manufactured by Nitty Gritty, but it's sold, Audio Advisor is the one that commissions it and sells it. And it's about $200. Um, you may be able to get it on sale for like $150, but yeah. It's, it's a good bit of money, but um, it will protect your record collection and also it will make the records sound a lot better because they won't have surface noise because there's this kind of misconception that records are supposed to you know, have ticks and pops and, and all this background noise. And the, the fact is that unless there are actual scratches on the record, most of that noise comes from debris and you it is possible to get that debris off the record and have silent playing records. Um, very few records in my collection have any real noticeable surface noise because I don't buy scratch records and I clean my records. Um, it's a complete myth and misconception that records have to be noisy and have background noise and ticks and pops. It's just, it's, it's a, um, you know, it's a myth. And with a good record cleaning machine, you can not only help preserve your records, preserve your stylus, which in some cases can get very expensive, and have them sound better. Um, it's kind of a win-win. You just have to invest a little money. So if you if you want one, if you want a machine that will vacuum clean your records, but you still have to t you know you still have to turn it by hand. It's not motorized. Um, the Record Doctor Five is a good entry level option at two hundred dollars. Now, very recently. Uh, Project Audio has come out with a record cleaning machine of their own. It is motorized. Um, I have had no experience with it. I've never used it. But um, from what I hear, it's good. It's motorized, and and so it's it's much less labor intensive than the Record Doctor is, and um, it cleans your records. It vacuum cleans your records uh, automatically. So um, I think it's a good option to explore it's it's you know you're going to pay a little bit more for that ease of use and the fact that you can clean records faster on it so if you have a good record collection it might be it might be a good idea um, that's about five hundred dollars the project is about five hundred dollars and um, you know in this case I, I think you get what you pay for now if you want to spend a little bit more money um, I think a much better option and actually the company that originated this record cleaning method is a record cleaning machine by a company called VPI and um, they make a machine called the VPI 16.5 record cleaning machine and more uh, this is the record cleaning machine that I own and I use and this is more the industry standard um, you know they were the first company to really come out and mass produce a, a vacuum vinyl record cleaning machine they've been doing it for 30 years and um, if the thing is built like a tank it can clean records really quickly and it's super user friendly and um, to me this is my top recommendation it's about se uh, it's about seven hundred dollars if I, I, I think if they sell it as a kit you get some like fluid and brushes and things like that with it but yeah it's about six or seven hundred dollars um, it's not cheap I don't pretend that, it, that this thing you know these machines and this hobby is going to be inexpensive but um, I think you, especially in these record cleaning machines, you get what you pay for. And if you have like, you know, like a, you know, 300, 400, 500 records in your collection, um, I think this thing kind of pays for itself, really. Especially if you're buying used records. If you want to buy used records, you really do need some type of, of, of way to clean them. And I think the vacuum machines are the most cost effective way. There is one more way to clean your records. And, um, this is a bit of a newer technology, but there's something called cavitation. You ever seen, if you've ever seen old jewelry cleaners, like the, uh, these like jewelry cleaning machines that have like, you put water in them and they make this like really high pitched buzz. And you just, you put your metal jewelry into this tank and it cleans it. 
um, it cleans it through a method called cavitation, which is essentially like microscopic bubbles scrubbing the material. Um, a couple, you know, maybe five or ten years ago, someone figured out that you could clean records this way. Um, and so a company, I think, I think the first, one of the first companies to come out with this a record cleaning machine that uses cavitation was Audiodesk. Um, and I remember this, I remember when this machine came out and I think it came out maybe like, I want to say like seven years ago. And, um, yeah, it's like a couple thousand dollars. It's quite expensive. When this technology first came out in record cleaning machines, they were quite expensive. Um, and so that's why, you know, capitation hasn't really been on my radar. I've known about it, but it, for me, like, I don't, I don't want to spend that much money on a record cleaning machine when the VPI machine does a great job for me. Um, but from what I understand, the cavitation machines really get the record cleaner because they really just wipe out any microscopic anything that's in the grooves. They really just loosen it all up. Um, from what I understand, they're more effective. They, they, this is the most effective way to clean records. Um, now, now that the technology isn't so foreign and it's and it's you know more and more companies are coming out with record cleaning machines that use cavitation. I think just recently I heard about a company that's making a machine that costs like six, seven hundred dollars. The problem is this is all very new and I just don't have a lot of experience with it. Maybe someone in the comments has more experience with cavitation record cleaning machines, but this is just not an area where I am, you know, super informed. So, you know, maybe someday I'll get a cavitation machine. I don't know. I've heard they can do wonders. A lot of record stores, like um, a couple of record stores that I've been to that are that are really audiophile focused actually have shop cavitation machines and their higher priced records will they'll clean them on the cavitation machines um, I think that's really cool because then then it's you know super cost effective if you want to do it that way so you know maybe if you're really serious look into a cavitation machine um, you know if you if you you know in a couple of years you find yourself with a collection of thousands of records and you really enjoy collecting old used records, um, a cavitation machine might be a sound investment. Um, you know, maybe, you know, I think a reasonable one probably might set you back like around a thousand dollars. You know, who am I to say, you know, what, what someone's budget for record cleaning should be? I just, I know what's reasonable for me. And right now for me, cavitation's not a reasonable option financially. But I just wanted to make you aware that it is an effective and um, good way to clean records as well as, as vacuum cleaning machines. However, you know, all the fancy, you know, you can, on the, on the internet and on rec in record stores, there's all these fancy brushes and, and you know, the spin clean and the, Cro I think Crosley even makes like a record uh, dunking, you know, device. Those things, they're not really doing the job. Um, so my advice to people getting into record collecting is vacuum machine or a cavitation machine. I think those are your two best options. Um, that's what I recommend and that's what I have experience with personally. I think I've talked enough about this now. Um, so even though I just spent, you know, I just talked your ear off about record cleaning machines, I want to kind of get back to talking about um, you know, what you're going to need if you want to get into record collecting besides just a record cleaning machine. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, people that are very, very new that, you know, don't have any records yet and don't have anything, any equipment, maybe you want to just buy new records for a while and hold off on a record cleaning machine, you know, save it for a rainy day. I think that's fine. Um, you know, I think it's a good idea to clean new records, but you're, I don't think you're going to cause much damage to anything, either the record or your, um, your stylus, if, if, you know, you're, you're not cleaning new records, as long as you give them, you know, a little brushing before you play them with a carbon fiber brush. Um, I, I think playing new records without a record cleaning machine is okay. So if you want to hold off on that, I get it. I understand. It's, it's, we're talking lots of different pieces of equipment that cost a lot of money. I, you know, I've been there. Um, but now I want to talk about the essential things you'll need, like a turntable, like an amp, like speakers, because, you know, so many people I know buy 
you know, kind of buy blind, buy, buy their first pieces of audio gear blind. And what I really don't want, what I'm really afraid of is I'm afraid of people that could be, you know, record collectors, that could be enthusiasts who want to get into vinyl. They don't know much, so they go to Target and buy a Crosley Cruiser or, you know, an Audio Technica LP60 or something like that. And they play, their rec they play records on it and they say, oh, this doesn't sound great. Oh, I, I hear my records getting worse. Like it must be the record wear, and and they get and they they're not impressed with with the format, and they get discouraged and they stop. They stop buying records. They stop caring about turntables and things like that. And that's what I'm afraid of. And that's why I'm doing this video because I want people to, you know, get started in a reasonable way. That's going to show people, you know, what the format has to offer. So that being said, now I'm going to talk about some gear that I think you should consider if you're looking to get into, into vinyl as a hobby. Um, because, you know, there are affordable options. Um, I know everyone's definition of affordable is a little different. You know, people who, like me, who are huge audiophile enthusiasts who have been collecting for years, you know, obviously I'm going to be interested in different gear than someone starting out. Um, I think that's the joy of this hobby is you get to kind of go at your own pace. But I think there is a base level a kind of a bare minimum that you need to really be able to a play records carefully and safely and also um, to get something good sounding that's going to have good fidelity so you can experience what what makes records sound so good what makes the analog medium sound so good um, and why everyone seems to be talking about vinyl nowadays it's because it, it, it sounds good if you have good equipment to play it back on so um, so the three main things you're going to need if you want to play records is you're going to need a turntable, you're going to need an amplifier, and you're going to need speakers. Um, you're also going to need cables and probably speaker stands, but th those are kind of extraneous things. But the main things you're going to need, you're going to need three main components um, to have a stereo, a stereo system. That's what you play back records on, a stereo. You know, it's not a Bluetooth speaker hooked up you know, connected wirelessly to your phone. Like this is this is old school technology, and that's the way records are meant to be experienced. You know, you yeah, you can get an all-in-one turntable and plug it into a sound bar. It's not going to sound good. Um, so anyway, I'm going to get off the soapbox and and throw at you some suggested pieces of of audio gear to help get you along. So the first thing we got to talk about is is turntables, and I think. We're talking new here, yes. Um, you can get used stereo equipment. Um, there's actually a big market for vintage stereo equipment. However, I think for people first getting into the hobby, it, it makes more sense to buy new, and I'm going to tell you why. Yes, you can get a good turntable. You can get a good vintage turntable for, at least when I was buying vintage gear, you know, $200. You can, get, you can go and get like a Techniques direct drive turntable, not a not an SL1200, but you know, something like that, like a like a Techniques SLD2 or something. You can get one of those for 200 bucks. And it's a good table. The problem is the vintage audio equipment market is an educated person's market. You know, if you're going to buy things second hand, you have to know what to look for because I, it, you know, so many people I know have who have gone the vintage route who aren't experienced in audio equipment will buy something and then something in it will stop working and they don't know what to do and now they just have a piece of gear that they can't afford to go get repaired and doesn't really work right and so now they have no stereo and um, you know it's something they maybe could have avoided when they were going to look at the piece of equipment but if you're not experienced in amplifiers and turntables and speakers if you don't have a lot of knowledge in the hobby you're not going to know what to look for and so it's really easy to end up with, with a brick, basically, in buying vintage audio. So for people that are starting out in the hobby, yeah, it, it can on paper, it can look a little cheaper to go used. But my advice is to go with something new that if there's a problem with it, you can return it. And, and you know, it, it's made by companies that are in business and have technical support. And I just... I. I think it's a much safer idea for someone that's new to the hobby. So that's my advice to go, is to buy new. And if you're looking at turntables, I think decent turntables 
start at around the four hundred dollar mark new. Um, that's just that's that's where they are. Um, you know, if you go cheaper than that, you start really sacrificing core functions. You start sacrificing the ability to change out the cartridge. You start sacrificing adjustable tone arms. You start sacrificing vibration control in the design of the turntable. You know, you know these companies that make turntables, they're not big companies. You know, they invest a lot of money in R&D, and it costs them a lot of money to produce these things. Um, you know, it's not like a CD. It's not like a Sony CD player where they're pumping out millions of them every year. Um, you know, it's it's a different kind of industry. So you know, I think good good turntables from decent companies tend to start around four hundred dollars. You can go up from there. I'm going to personally recommend a couple turntables at slightly different price points um, that I have experience with, that I'm familiar with and comfortable with, and I think would be great starting turntables. I think the absolute cheapest, really good turntable that you should be looking at is a turntable by a company called Project Audio. They're an Austrian company that manufactures their tables in and around Europe. And um, uh, they make a turntable called the Debut Carbon Turntable. It's around $400, and I think it's a great starting turntable. You get a really good cartridge on it. You know, it, it's, a, it's a good sounding table. It's not the best thing ever. It's not going to be, you know, the super audiophile treatment, but it's a turntable that's going to sound really good. And if you've never heard, uh, you know, an analog cut, analog mastered vinyl record played on a decent turntable, like a, like a $400 project, for people that grew up on MP3s, it's going to be a revelation. That's what it was for me. You know, I listened to, you know, CDs growing up on boom boxes, and then I got an MP3 player, and I listened to MP3s for many, many years. And I'll tell you, um, listening to vinyl records for the first time on, on a decent turntable, ooh, I wouldn't trade that feeling for anything in the world. So, you know, even something as simple as the Project Debut Carbon Table at $400 will we'll do it right. Um, it comes with a good cartridge. You can upgrade, like the table is upgradable. You can get a better platter for it. You can get a better cartridge for it. You can get the external speed box for it. Um, so you can build it slowly. But it's a good solid table and, and um, you know, if that's the last table you ever buy, it'll, it'll be pretty decent. It doesn't get anything really wrong. It's, it's sins are of omission. Um, another good option at about $450 is, is another turntable manufacturer that I really like called uh, Rega. Um, they make a series of turntables called the planar, planar turntables. And their entry level in the planar series is the Rega Planar 1. And uh, you can pick that up for around $450. It's about $50 more expensive than the project. It's a really good table. They're designed and manufactured in England. Um, very, very similar at this at this price point. They're very similar to the Project turntables. Um, now, if you want to spend just a little bit more money, um, a really good turntable I, I recommend a lot is is the Project Debut Carbon Esprit. Um, it's it's basically a factory upgraded version of the Project Debut Carbon. What's different about it? Well, instead of the uh, aluminum platter that comes on the Debut Carbon, um, the Carbon Esprit comes with a uh, acrylic platter, which is just gonna be flat out better sounding. Um, it's, a, it's a harder, denser material than the aluminum. It doesn't ring. It's, it's it gonna improve the sound quality quite a bit. So it comes with a acrylic platter. It also comes with a um, speed, a motor speed controller built into the turntable. That's an upgrade you can purchase as an external to the regular Debut Carbon, but the Debut Carbon Esprit comes with that speed control box in it. And not only does that help stabilize the speed of the turntable, it's, it's, it's running off you know, a generated um, speed control rather than the speed control based on the current you get just out of the, out of the, the wall wart power socket. But also um, it allows you to change the speed of the turntable at the push of a button. You know how some records are meant to be played at 33 uh, and a third rotations per, per minute. And, um, some records are meant to be played at 45 RPM. Now, on these basic entry-level turntables, how you normally would do that is if you want to change speeds, you take off the platter and adjust the belts setting 
underneath the platter and that's how you change speeds. But if you have a speed controller, especially one that's built into the turntable, in order to change speeds, all you have to do is push a button. So with those upgrades, um, you know, those are upgrades you can do to the project table on their own. Um, but it actually comes out a little cheaper if you buy the Debut Carbon Esprit um, because they're built into the, the manufacturing cost of the table and you save a little bit of money if you just buy it upgraded like that from the factory. Um, and that, that, is, uh, that table, the way it is, costs about $600. Now, if, if you know, you're not a broke 20-something like most of us are and you want to... Um, you want to start your analog journey with something a little bit nicer. Um, a table that I actually currently own and that I'm in love with is, is, a, is another Rega turntable. It's the Rega Planar 3. Um, this turntable comes with a better stylus. It has way better uh, vibration management. Um, it, like The design tolerances are a lot greater. It's really an audiophile. Uh, piece of art. Um, the Rega Planar 3 is a great turntable. Actually, if you look back in in my videos, I did a review of this turntable, so I'm not going to talk too much about it, but um, this is substantially more expensive than the entry-level offerings um, you're going to find. The, this turntable with the cartridge costs about, I think most places right now have it for um, $1,150, so uh, basically $1,100 for this turntable. Um, it's expensive and, and I don't, it's, you know, that kind of money is nothing to scoff at. So, you know, for most people getting into analog and, and vinyl and, and turntables and things like that, this isn't on your radar and I don't blame you. But, you know, if you're, you know, if you have the money and you say, I really want to jump into a good analog setup, I think the Rega Planar 3 checks all the boxes. I, I think um, you could do a lot worse for the money. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to mention it at least. So now that you have a turntable, what else do you need to be able to play records? Well, you need something to take the signal that comes out of the turntable and amplify it into sound. And for that, you need an amplifier, specifically an integrated amplifier, usually. Now, they do make you know separate preamp and power amps. Um, however, I think for most people who are getting into audio, you're not looking at separates. You're looking at an integrated amplifier. It's an all-in-one box. Now, what's important to say is that in your hunt for an integrated amplifier for your stereo setup, one important thing is that you want to probably find an amplifier that has a phono input. You see, the, the level of sound that comes out of the cables of a turntable is not the same level of sound that comes out of a standard RCA connection. So like, a CD player, a Blu-ray player, things like that. That's normal line level sound coming out of those RCAs. What comes out of a turntable is even lower. So in order to hear the sound out of a turntable, you need a special preamp called a phono preamp. Um, and some integrated amplifiers have a built-in phono preamp and some do not. If, if uh, the integrated amplifier doesn't have a phono setting on it, like it doesn't have a have a switch that says phono, or have a connection on the back that says phono, um, chances are it doesn't have a, a phono preamp in it, and if you want to use your turntable with that amplifier, you have to buy a separate box that is a small standalone phono preamp. The amplifiers, the integrated amplifiers that I'm going to recommend to you in this video do have phono preamps in them. So you, you just have an all-in-one box that has a phono preamp and you can also plug in a CD player or you know any you know a DAC or your iPod or anything you want into it. But they do have a phono preamp section of the amplifier. And again we're we're talking you know we're talking pieces of gear in the range of the, the low hundreds here. Um, so I think the cheapest the cheapest um, decent integrated amplifier you can buy is a um, amplifiers by the Yamaha. Um, I'm sure most people are familiar with Yamaha. They make tons of stuff from, you know, amplifiers to surround sound receivers to musical instruments to motorcycles for some reason. I don't know. I've never really understood Yamaha as a company. Um, but they make a line of, of integrated amplifiers that are really good value for money. Um, 
uh, they make one called the AS301BL, which is a 60 watt per channel integrated amplifier and includes a digital audio converter, a DAC in it, so you can you know, play digital audio and the DAC will, will um, convert the signal in high res. You have that entry level Yamaha that costs about $350. Um, you can you can go for a little more power, a little more juice in a, a similar type of Yamaha. They make the Yamaha AS five hundred one BL. Um, this is an eighty five watt per channel uh, integrated, and it has the same features as the three hundred one, um, including a DAC and whatever. Um, this amplifier is about five hundred fifty dollars, and. Um, there's a similar amplifier from a company called Marantz. Now, I think personally, with my experience with Marantz, is that they're a little bit higher quality than the Yamaha amplifiers. So if, if, if you're looking for a little bit better build quality and, and just in general a sound quality that I think will pair better with more different types of speakers, I think I would push you towards the Marantz. Um, they make an amplifier called the PM6006. Um, it's 45 watts per channel and includes also includes a DAC, a digital audio converter, and this amplifier is $550. Now, those of you paying attention may be saying, now Michael, um, the, the top of the line Yamaha at $550 is 85 watts per channel, whereas the $550 Marantz, that's the same amount of money, is only 45 watts per channel. Doesn't that, that, doesn't that mean the Yamaha is better? No, it doesn't. Just so you know, you can go out and buy a $100 um, home theater receiver you know, from Best Buy, and it may say 800 watts per channel. I guarantee you that 45 watt per channel Marantz is gonna play louder and sound better than the 800 watt per channel piece of shit, um, you know, Vizio surround receiver or whatever it is, um, because of you know, the design of the transformers, the, the way the power is channeled in the amplifier, there's way more factors than just the watts per channel. Watts per channel are a good place to start to get an idea because, you know, if you have a set of speakers that are rated at 200 watts per channel per se, um, you may not want to be powering those speakers, especially, and especially if they're rated as being inefficient, which means they have like a, a decibel rating of like 84 dB, very inefficient. It means you may not want to be powering those with a 10 watt per channel tube amp. You might not get the most out of those speakers. However, you know, I think when we're talking about, I, I know I'm getting really technical and I'm, I'm going to try not to overwhelm the audience with all this jargon, but basically what you need to know about amplifier power is that for most of these entry level speakers, these entry level bookshelf speakers that I'm going to be talking about, you know, just a basic, you know, something around 50 watts per channel of a good quality company like Marantz or Yamaha or Riga or, you know, something like that. Um, you know, a good quality integrated amp at 50 watts per channel is going to be enough for most of these speakers. Um, if you get into big, you know, expensive floor standing speakers, yeah, we're going to be talking about needing some more, more juice, but for, for, you know, bookshelf speakers, the kind of stuff I'm going to be talking about when I get to speakers, all these amps will work fine. So you have the Marantz 6006, 45 watts per channel, $550. To me, like, if, if I were building a first stereo system, I would pick the Marantz. But if you're, if you're on a budget, um, the Yamaha is also a good option. It's not going to sound bad. It's, I, I've, I, I've owned one. It sounds pretty good. I just have a preference for the Marantz because the Marantz is a little... The sound characteristic of the Marantz, I think, is a little easier listening, and it's and it's going to be easier to pair the Marantz with many different speakers. Whereas the Yamaha tends to have a slightly sharper sound quality that's a little brighter. And um, if you if you get a pair of speakers that maybe are already a little on the the bright sounding side, the combination of the two might not be as is 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 kind of um, mellow to listen to. Everyone's preference is different, and if you have the opportunity, um, you, you know, I would recommend going to listen to these amplifiers yourself. Um, a lot of audio stores do carry these entry-level amplifiers. Um, again, I'm just including one more amplifier in my list of recommendations because um, you know someone may be wanting to spend a little more money, maybe wanting to get a better experience. So, 
the last amplifier I'm going to recommend is also by the company uh, Rega, and it is the Rega Brio integrated amplifier. Um, now this amplifier is again only 50 watts per channel, and it doesn't include a DAC, but um, the build quality and the sound quality of the Rega is is a is a major step up from the Marantz and the Yamaha. Um, it's 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 in a different kind of quality level. I've listened to these these Rega amplifiers, the Brio and, and the more expensive ones in the Rega line. And, and they are better sounding than these entry-level Yamaha and Marantz amps. Um, so if you really want to get a little more analog goodness, I do, I do recommend the, the Rega Brio. Um, it's about $1,000. So if you really want to spend the money, I would, I would point you to that one at that price point. And of course, in audio, you know, you can you can be looking at amps that cost you know forty thousand dollars. You know, this, there's really no the sky's the limit in this hobby. So you know, but if you're looking at stuff that's more expensive than than what I'm talking about here, you're probably not in the entry level, and you probably need to do research beyond what I'm talking about. So you know, I I kind of know the audience I'm talking to here, and I I'm pretty sure you guys aren't the audience looking at you know, looking to spend, you know, six figures on your stereo. So I, I, I feel like I'm picking out reasonable gear choices for people that are looking to dip their toes into the analog waters. So I've given you some recommendations for turntables. I've given you some recommendations for amps. Now I want to talk about speakers. And I just got to say that there's so many more choices in terms of speakers um, that you have to choose from and I'm not going to cover every option that, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to cover every good, you know, bookshelf speaker in the entry level range for you. Generally, I, I tend to think for most people who are getting started, I think bookshelf speakers are the way to go. So I'm recommending some bookshelf speakers. Um, do with it what you will. So um, speakers, I think you have a lot of options in terms of bang per buck, and I'm going to list some different speakers at different price points. I think one of the cheapest really good bookshelf speakers um, out there right now is the Wharfdale Diamond 10.1s. Um, Wharfdale is a very old speaker company that's been doing this for a long time and their diamond level of loudspeakers have always been great for the money and actually if you're looking for floor standing speakers the Wharfdales probably are not going to be that expensive but you know they make a great bookshelf speaker the Diamond 10.1 and you can pick it up for $200. Um, it's not horribly expensive. But I think the real sweet spot in bookshelf speakers is a, a fairly recent bookshelf speaker by a company called ELAC. And that is the ELAC B6. Um, I think the most recent one is the B6.2. Um, and you can pick that up, speaker up for $300. That set of speakers up for $300. Um, and this speaker is interesting because it's designed by a very famous audio engineer named Andrew Jones. And Andrew Jones, um, you know, has designed speakers for very intense audio companies. Um, Andrew Jones has designed many award-winning speakers that retail for, again, like $20,000. Um, you know, he's designed some very high-end, very expensive audio gear. And what's cool about these ELAC speakers is he he's done interviews, I've listened to him, he, he enjoyed the challenge of being able to design a really high quality speaker at a, at a very affordable price point. And, um, you know, what he was able to do with these, I've heard them, what he's able to do with these ELAC speakers at $300, I think is extraordinary. So I think um, you really can do, it, it's very tough to do better at this price than the, the ELAC B6.2. Again, $300, I probably my number one recommendation if you're looking for an entry-level stereo system. Um, if you want to spend a little bit more money, um, I'm a big fan of a company called Kef, a British, British speaker manufacturer that have, again, been around for a long time and uh, doing you know pretty innovative speaker designs. Um, they make a uh, bookshelf speaker called the, the Q, the Q350. Um, I used to own the previous design of the Q series, the Q300s. They no longer make the Q300s, now they're the Q350s, which I haven't heard, but I've heard the Q300s, and um, for the money, they're very good bookshelf speakers. They retail for about $600, um, 
I've seen them on sale for in the, somewhere in the five range. So if you're looking for, you know, if you're looking to spend a little more than the Elax, I would say five to six hundred dollars, you can get a pair of Kef Q three fifties. They use their um, UniQ driver technology, which is a driver technology that they invented themselves. And it's a trickle down from their more high end speakers, one of which I'm going to talk about now, which is the speakers that I personally own. These are the Kef LS 50s. Um, these are uh, a pair of very small uh, monitors, very small pair of speakers made by Kef. And it's actually one of one of their two flagship speakers. I mean, this is it's really one of their statements as a brand, these Kef LS50 speakers that um, you can just go online and look up anything about these speakers. Uh, when they came out a couple years ago, they took the audio world by storm because people assumed and, and thought and reviewed, rightly so, that these speakers are an incredible value for the money. Um, they retail for, you can get pick them up for around $1,200 and um, you know, I've been to audio shows and listened to a lot of speakers. Um, I personally, I think these speakers sound a lot. The, the, the quality that you get in sound quality and build quality is is greater than the price that you pay for them. Um, I've heard more expensive speakers that do not sound as good as these Kef LS 50s. And the great part is they're small, so they'll work in lots of different spaces. Yeah, you can put them in a big living room. But they work great in bedrooms. They work, you know, they're they're compact enough that they don't require a huge amount of space as long as you keep them maybe a foot away from the the walls behind them. You're good. Um, get them on, put them on some speaker stands, uh, and and you're all set. So if you really want high end speakers, those are the speakers I recommend. The Kef LS fifties again, twelve hundred dollars is a lot of money, especially for someone getting into the hobby. So you know. There are other speakers available. I, I, you know, there's some great two hundred, three hundred dollars speakers out there. I don't want to try to push you to the more expensive option. I'm just, I'm letting you know it's available if you really have the ability and desire to spend the money. Um, so now you have a turntable, you have an amplifier, and you have a set of speakers. So you're all set, right? Well, no, you need a few other things. Um, you do need cables. You need cables to connect. Um, you know, hopefully your turntable will come with, with some phono cables to connect it to the amplifier, but you'll need speaker cables. Um, and you know, if you're connecting a CD player or something, you will need RCA cables. Um, and cables are, um, if you, you're not, you're not used to the audio community, you'll learn very quickly that cables are a very contentious matter. There is a whole group of people who, who think that, you know, the, the idea of, of different levels of speaker cable is nonsense and you can go to Home Depot and get zip cord and it will, you know, you can get the bulk spool zip cord from Home Depot and it should sound exactly the same as these $3,000 speaker cables from this company. And, you know, through my listening and through hearing many, many, many different pieces of audio gear and many different pieces of cable, I think... I, the evidence points to that not being the case. Uh, cables make a difference. However, it's it's easy to go overboard on cables. I'm not recommending that people getting into audio spend a lot of money on cables. I think a good rule for any system is to budget, you know, 10% of your audio budget on speaker cables. So, you know, if your audio budget is like, you know, $1,200, maybe budget like $100 for a nice pair of speaker cables. Um, I'm not going to recommend specific speaker cables because um, I'm just going to recommend some companies that, that I have heard good cables come from. And most of these companies make uh, good cables, especially speaker cables, at an affordable price at every price point. So, you know, most of these cables, like you can get pretty good speaker cables for most of these companies for around $50. You don't have to spend a lot of money, but I just I think you should do something a little bit better than like Radio Shack brand speaker cable or like Amazon Basics, stuff like that. Pay a little bit more for good engineering, um, good materials, you know, maybe a little bit of, of R&D design. Um, I think some good some good cables that you can get are made by companies. Um, there's Blue Jean, Blue Jean cables, also sometimes called Belden cables. Um, Moro Audio is a United States based cable manufacturer. I've had good experience with their cables. 
Um, Audio Quest is uh, a company that's been around for a long time, and you can actually you can get their cables at Best Buy if they have like a Magnolia Design Center. You can get Audio Quest cables. Um, you know, Audio Quest X2 speaker cables are ones I recommend a lot because they're they're pretty cheap. You can get you know a big like a big spool of them for like eighty bucks. You can get you know, and you can cut them and crimp them yourself. Um, Kimber is, uh, my reference pair of speaker cables are Kimber ATCs, which are more expensive than I think you guys are going to be looking at, but they also make cheaper speaker cables. You can get Kimber cables, speaker cables for, I think, less than $100. Um, Transparent Cables are a company based in the Northeastern United States. They're really great. Um, They're also an independent company. And Wireworld, which is a British company, they make some good speaker cables and interconnects. So spend a little bit of money on cables. Don't go overboard because they're not the most important thing in a system, but they're a great way to kind of round out the system. And you don't want to buy a bunch of expensive gear and hook it up with crap. Just just don't do that. And um, uh, also, if you're buying bookshelf speakers, you really got to invest in some speaker stands, I think. Um, because the problem is, the problem I see most often is that people will put their speakers on the same surface that their turntable is on, and that's just a dumb idea. Um, I, I, I shouldn't have to explain it, but I will. Turntables are susceptible to vibration. You want no vibration interference on your turntable. If you have a wooden table and you set vibrating speakers on that wooden table that your turntable is sitting on, it, the vibration's going to bleed over and you're going to get distortion. This should be like, you know, a basic concept that most people should understand, but I can't tell you how many Instagram pictures I've seen of people doing this. So I just want to make sure I say black and white, don't do that. Put your turntable on a table that's preferably a little bit away from your speakers, either in the center, and you know, between your speakers, or like, you know, a ways off to the side and put your speakers on some speaker stands. Spend a little bit of money, you know, you can get some pretty good speaker stands for between, you know, let's say 70 and $150. You can get some nice either metal or MDF speaker stands. Um, Don't get plastic. Um, They don't, uh, plastic speaker stands are just, are not a good idea. They're, you know, people get them for their home theaters, but they don't handle vibration well. Because you also, you know, you want something that's stable for the speaker. You don't want a lot of, um, you know, wiggle in the speaker stand. You want it to be very sturdy, and you also don't want to pass that vibration from the speaker along, along the floor. Like especially if you have like carpet or wood floors, you don't want to be passing that vibration along the floor to whatever is holding up your turntable. Oh, one thing I'll mention before I go, um, you know. If you're if you're like me and you know you have lived or still live in urban environments, sometimes speakers aren't always the best way to listen to music. Um, lots of lots of people listen on headphones, and um, you know all the all the integrated amplifiers I recommended here have pretty good headphone uh, sections in them. Uh, have good powered headphone jacks, and um, it might be worth your while to get a nice pair of. Um, probably open back headphones. Um, These are the kind of open back headphones are the kind of headphones that are meant for listening at home. You know, they're not portable. They don't seal off sound. Um, You know, you can hear the outside world and the outside world can kind of hear you. So they're not good for, you know, taking them on a train or anything or using with your iPod, but a good pair of open back headphones um, can be a good thing if you want to enjoy your records in let's say it's 11 at night and you live in a tiny apartment building and you have neighbors. Um, Headphones are a great way to be able to listen in those type of situations. Some good open back headphones that I would recommend for use with with the amplifiers I just listed. Um, I think AKG makes a lot of good entry-level headphones. Um, There's a pair of headphones made by them called the AKG K240s I think that you know, retail for around, I think last time I checked, they're around like $60. And they're really great sounding headphones for the money. Um, And you can go up the AKG range in open back headphones. Um, I I say open back because, you know, in addition to them being meant for listening at home, I think open back headphones give you the sense of space that speakers do. Um, Whereas closed back headphones, the kind of headphones that you would use for portable listening, 
you know, they, they, they benefit from being a sealed, a sealed headphone that cuts off a little bit of noise and doesn't disturb people around you. But I don't think they have the sense of like three dimensional space and dynamics that, that open back headphones can provide. So that's why I'm talking about open back headphones for, you know, listening to vinyl, which is not a portable medium. Um, so those AKG 240s, and if you go up the AKG range, you can get, you know, they make really good headphones. Um, I have a pair of K, uh, K6, K612s um, that I really enjoy. I think those were like $120, maybe $150, something around them. Um, what are some other good headphones? Um, Philips makes a, a pair of headphones called the Fidelio X2s, Philips Fidelio X2s that are really good for the money. Um, I think you can pick them up for less than $200. Um, what else? Sennheiser. Sennheiser is always a good option. They make tons of good headphones. Um, some of them, uh, you may need something more than just that integrated amplifier to power, but some of the entry level ones you should be okay with, like the uh, HD like five, nine somethings I think are, are good options. Um, uh, Audis make good headphones. I mean, I, now I'm starting to get into more expensive headphones, but um, I think for, you know, if you're looking for a budget option, um, those AKG K240s, I've recommended those to friends and they tell me they really love them and I've heard them before and they're, they're really good. So yeah, if you want to add headphones to your stereo or if, you know, maybe you can't afford a good pair of speakers right now, but you want to get the turntable and the amp and, and just listen on headphones, you know, 60 bucks, you got a pair of, of, of good quality open back headphones and um, you can listen to music and enjoy it and listen to vinyl and, and get, you know, some nice sound quality in that package. Um, yeah, so I think I've covered everything I need to cover. As always, guys, um, let me know in the comments if you have any questions. You know, I'm gearing this video towards a different audience than my normal audience, which is hardcore record collectors. So I have a feeling the people that will see this video first are hardcore record collectors that may already know the things I'm talking about. Um, so to those people, I mean, if you watch this all the way through, thank you for continuing to watch my videos, even though this probably wasn't all that relevant to you. But um, to the new people who may be seeing this, um, and, and not be familiar with the YouTube vinyl community. Uh, thanks again for, for watching, and I hope I was some help to you in, in your potential journey into, into vinyl and record collecting. And um, that's really all I wanted to do, is, was kind of give as much information as I think is relevant and helpful to people starting out in this. Um, if you have any questions at all, uh, let me know in the comments or shoot me a private message, but um, I, I will try to respond to as many comments, uh, questions in the comments as I, as I am able to. And um, yeah, I, I hope this was helpful. And um, yeah, uh, I'll be doing some more videos soon that are a little more nerdy and into what this channel is normally about um, very soon. I just haven't had a ton of time lately. I've been very, very busy. I've been doing a lot of freelance work in the Phoenix area in addition to working on a doctorate. So um, I just haven't had a lot of time to uh, think about you know, vlogging about records. But um, I have a little bit of free time now, and I'm going to try to get back at it and uh, look for more videos from me in the future. Um, until next time, cheers, guys.